Hello. Well, first up, I was just wondering how you personally find the time and the space to connect with nature with such a busy schedule of performing and traveling and seeing lots of cities. I've always been searching it out um, because I've always, I think might that be that I come from the Midwest. I come from Kansas and so the big sky and the huge long horizon has always been a part of my my fiber really. We would always go to Colorado in the summers and so the mountains and the stars and watching the tornado storms roll in. I, those are some of my strongest memories growing up. And it's always been a source of comfort and restoration for me. Um, it's true, a busy traveling schedule has kept me away from it in many ways. Although I've been able to see parts of the world and corners of the world that I would not necessarily have ever seen. Iguazu Falls and Victoria Falls and um, Africa. And I mean, just incredible places that, that expanded my appreciation of nature greatly. But the pandemic where I was in one place, um, I realized I was able to see 14 cycles of the moon uninterrupted from the same vantage point. And with an appreciation that I have now that I didn't necessarily have when I was seven years old, it's been really powerful actually, the, these last two years in that regard. I'm presuming this program was heavily influenced by reflections during lockdown. Was it a program where the genesis began quite a while away in anticipation of the shutdown? Actually, it did. It, the, the beginning seeds of this really started right after our last project began, War and Peace, which was five years ago, over five years ago now, here in Brussels. We launched it also um, in Brussels. And the impact of that piece and the context in which we developed it was so, the impact of it was immediate. And myself and the orchestra, Maxime, our conductor, we all felt that this was a formula and a, an approach that we we really wanted to expand on. And immediately we knew that we wanted the topic to be about the climate. But the stumbling block for me as I tried to really lean into, okay, this is, this is about climate change, right? Yeah, this is what I have to do as a good citizen. I've got to talk about the climate. That was a coat that I didn't know how to wear it. It didn't feel right. And at the same time, I, I didn't quite know how to make translate that into a theatrical piece. And so I've been thinking about it a lot. And I do think it's it came into vision a bit because of the pandemic. And, I, and the question I kept asking myself was, how can I best contribute to this moment in time with the platform that I have, with the voice that I have, with the ideas that I have. And I realized I'm not going to add anything to the world by sounding more alarms, by sort of, you know, mm, screaming at the top of my lungs, we have to do something. It's like, that's not effective coming from me. And the more I thought about it, I was like, I don't think the issue that's really bothering me is the climate per se. I'm much more interested in what is that part within us that just go, mm, that we see all these terrible things in front of our eyes, constantly flooded 24 seven. You know, I mean, I come from the US, you know, I look at school shootings and the whole country just kind of goes, oh God, that's terrible. And we go on about our daily lives. Um, social injustice, all the, in, all the different kinds and reaches of inequality that we see across the board. And this sort of general consensus of, well, that's a terrible thing, but what can I do? That, that kind of level of disconnect, that's what pulled me into this project. And that's what I think I'm attempting to look into and address with Eden. For me, the power comes from what the music is showing us. When you hear Mahler, for example, um, ich atme deinen Linden duft, and you feel the minute that opening chord sounds, just it sort of just happens into existence, there's peace that enters the conversation.
And I guarantee you, everybody listening to this right now can recall at least one moment where they were in the embrace, the perfect embrace of nature. And for a fleeting moment, or for one full sunset, or for one perfect spring afternoon, we knew what it was to be in that balance and harmony of nature. That's what's depicted for me in the work of Mahler. And so I say, as always, music is teaching me and showing the way, going, this is what it feels like. And then you get the fury of Gluck and it's going, this is what it feels like when you won't let go. This is what it feels like when you're disconnected and pulled out of your center. We have the example in music. And that's, for me, that's my teacher. And I think a lot of the listeners, they know what I'm talking about. Just stepping outside of music um, for a moment, I was wondering a little about the visual artists, poets, writers that particularly grab you with their evocation of the natural world. Well, very much on my mind is the poetry of Gene Shear. Um, he's, he wrote the text for um, the world premiere that is on this album and in the concerts we're giving. It's called The First Morning of the World and the music is by Rachel Portman. I came to Jean with the idea of, I need you to write something about Eden. We're going to create something for this project. And I'm sitting here going, I wouldn't want that, (laughs) that directive. Because where do you start? And how do you write about something that has been referenced for so long? And like all great artists, whether they're visual or poets or writers, he puts me in another place in time with his words. And he does it so simply, really incredibly simply. And he says, there's a language without question marks. You can read it in the leaves, the rings of trees, and in the wind and the river, and in the sound of birds singing. Has their song changed since the first morning of the world? And it just, you know, it sets my imagination on fire. And it makes me want to be there. And so I have to transport myself back to what I imagine the first morning of the world to be like. And all of a sudden, I'm in Eden, or whatever my imagination tells me Eden is. You know, I mean, I was just the time that I just spent in London there at the Royal Opera House was great. And, you know, you go to the British Museum and you see the concrete world of Egypt, you know, sort of invoked and in front of your eyes and then you go to the National Gallery and you're seeing the Turner and um, the these impressionistic paintings that that require your imagination to 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 join there so it's less concrete than what you see in the tombs and the sphinxes and I think all of it comes together to somehow um, connect into my imagination and to connect into my reference points and to expand those. And this is also part of what we're trying to do with how we present Eden as well is to not demonstrate it literally and physically, but to give enough space, which certainly happens in the music, but even visually as we now put this in in a concert format, to create space visually as well so that the audience can come in and start to imagine what their Eden feels like and looks like. And ideally, they'll find a way to go home and start creating that or continue to create it as well. When you were working, was Rachel Portman the composer you'd worked with previously? And how much contact did you have during that compositional process? Ah, it's exhilarating and so nerve-wracking at the same time. I had never worked with her. Um, her album Leaves and Trees really struck a chord with me. And I thought, oh, that's something really incredible because one of the qualities I really felt was important in this project was that we feel the nurturing part of Mother Nature Um, Right now, we're focused so much on the destruction that is happening in the environment, the forest fires and the tsunamis and the floods and the droughts. And it's all the destruction 
which is real, but there are also the flowers blooming. There's also the sun rising every morning, and there's also the breeze that still comes from the trees. And I think it's important to also not lose sight of that, to not let the headlines overwhelm what we're still witnessing the vast majority of our time, which is that nurturing quality of nature, the air that we breathe, the sun that gives us vitamin, vital vitamins and energy that's coming to us, the shelter from the storm. These things are also still present. And it doesn't mean to, that we turn a blind eye to the reality as well. I just don't want to forget that element of the reality. And she brings that into this music. So in the creation, when I asked her to be a part of this, she immediately um, expressed really enthusiastic interest. Thank you, Rachel. Um, because the environment and climate as well, this is a really a point of passion for her and a lifestyle that I think she is um, actively nurturing in her life. And we spoke at length, she and Jean and myself, um, about what we, the kind of journey we wanted the entirety of the project to bring people on and the direction, the invitation that we wanted to point people towards. And this is all about reconnecting to our nature, to the, to the natural world around us, to each other. This is the journey that, that the intention that we wanted to put out with this. And we spoke at length about it. And then Jean went away and did his work on the text. And it was a couple months, I think, until we got the text from Jean. And when I saw the title in my subject line on my email, the hairs on the back of my neck went up the first morning of the world. And I went, oh! immediately I said, I want to know what that is. And I think the final text maybe has two or three word changes in it, but basically what he sent was perfection. And then I asked Rachel, I said, would it help if I read through it a few times? She said, sure. And I sent her a tape of me just reading it a few times. And then in a couple of weeks we had the piece. I think it's, I personally think it's absolutely stunning piece, the sort of echoes of Copeland and all kinds of people. And as you say, the space around the sound is really tangible on it, so thank you. And the really important element of this was we knew that it would follow the Ives. So the, the, the album starts with Charles Ives, The Unanswered Question. And they knew that that piece was already in place. And so it was really deliberate how Jean started the text by bringing in the idea of questioning. And Rachel also really masterfully, I mean, of course, her piece can stand on its own. But this idea of connection, of bringing it from the world of the Ives and where the flute is trying to find the answer in the Ives and she brings it back as a principal voice in the score. And it takes us and then it leads us right into the Mahler of Ishat Matayin and Lindenduft. So you have these three genres and these three seemingly unrelated composers. And yet we've made this kind of triptych of uncertainty and questioning and then embarking on the journey and then finding ourselves in the lap of this perfect afternoon of Mahler. And I, it's, it's um, when I'm now performing it together, it's, um, it really takes my, my breath away to see how these pieces align and, and complement each other so deeply. Thank you. Um, skipping on to towards the end of the album, if I remember correctly, I adored the Wagner, um, a real standout track for me. I'm sure I won't be the only person wondering, could you ever be tempted? Are there any Wagner roles that you think you would be tempted to sing on stage if the circumstances aligned and the conditions were right? So I'm very excited to announce here on Presto Classical that I have my first Brunhilde's coming up. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, exclusive. <laughs> um, no, I am not. I don't see that in my future. Um, the Weisendank leader, however, has been a very surprising and very thrilling and welcome addition into my repertoire that I did not see coming. But in, in talking with Giulio D'Alessio, who runs Il Pomodoro and has been kind of a musical partner of mine for a long time, 
um, we we had this idea of doing a satellite project and recording the Vase and Donk leader as well with Il Pomodoro. So it would be on gut strings um, in 438 pitch, which was the, the tuning in the time of Wagner, and in sort of a chamber version. And we recorded those. So we have um, a satellite recording of the Vase and Donk leader, which we'll be bringing out later. But the thing about that music is it is such a visceral, passionate, extraordinary um, connection to the natural world, both within ourselves and the natural world. And so it was really ambitious of us to actually want to do this, but the result I think is very surprising and it's a new kind of reading on the Wesendank and it really is its own kind of testament to the natural world. And so this will be a satellite supplement to Eden as we go forward, very exciting. Oh, fabulous. I'm so looking forward to hearing that.